For our sixth Powering Through program, NCHS and Believe Digi went up to Northern California, where we participated in the Hemophilia Foundation of Northern California's Family Education Day, held at Oakland's Children's Hospital and Research Center. He is best known as a creator, writer, and star of the award-winning series, Stop the Bleeding. So with that, please welcome Patrick Lynch. Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. Thank you to the chapter for having us here today. The idea of this particular program, Powering Through, is to put together a conversational panel series with inspirational individuals from both within the bleeding disorders community and from outside of it to discuss challenges and obstacles that each of these individuals has faced in the pursuit of becoming their best selves. I'd like to introduce today's three panelists. On the far side, we have Bay Area sports junkie and community advocate, Ben Martin. <laughs> Wearing a fantastic jacket, we have professional world-ranked track athlete, Jeremy Dodson. <laughs> and right next to me, we have stylist and hemomom extraordinaire, Lauren Barbonis. Ben, you were once a sports journalist yeah. and you gave that up. I did. And since you've given that up, the San Francisco Giants have won the World Series. <laughs> the Golden State Warriors are having the best season in franchise yeah. history. Yeah. And the San Francisco 49ers are maybe the most head-scratching team in all of professional football. How are you doing with giving it up at exactly the wrong time? Well, I, I, got to do some, I still got to cover the World Series two year, three years ago. So I did the World Series in 2012. I, did, I got to cover the Warriors in the playoffs. I got to cover the 49ers last couple of games of Candlestick. So. And in fairness, you left that yeah. to make being a professional in this community and yeah. serving the community a, a full-time commitment. How long have you been doing that? So I've been working in the hemophilia industry for a little over a year now altogether. I made that change in large part because I've been doing so much more volunteering in the community over the years. I finished college, uh, wow, 11 years ago now. And, and over those 11 years, I've just been doing more and more. I'm one of the summer camp directors. I run a couple of programs for the chapter. And I wanted a job where I didn't have to take time off to do all that stuff. So that's been the biggest change. It's been a real blessing to be able to travel now in the hemophilia community and, and have that be on as part of my job description now. What seems to be a prevalent challenge or obstacle that's very 2015 California? Well, we're very lucky these days that the, the, the care itself has gotten so much better. The physical challenges aren't as much of a big deal anymore, but nowadays it's really the insurance and navigating the insurance world. Are there certain questions or certain issues that seem to come up more often than others that, that you kind of have to help people solve or point them toward resources? Yeah, the main thing is, especially when you're changing insurance plans, whether it be through a new job or whether, you know, whatever the reason, when you change an insurance plan, you really have to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row before you try to order factor. And you need to do that way ahead of time because you don't want to have to run out of factor and then suddenly find out that your prescription is expired or that you don't have the approval, the right approval code with your insurance. If you don't have everything exactly as it needs to be, they're not going to ship it to you. They look for any excuse not to. You make a great point, which is the ACA is still an evolving, living, breathing thing that we're coming to understand. And there, there are payers who are not used to having to deal with our community who previously could discriminate, frankly, because of pre-existing conditions or enforce prohibitive lifetime caps. They can't do that anymore, and they want to know why we're such an expensive population. So it's important. I feel the same way. It can be extremely frustrating. You just want to yell and scream, but then reach out to your resources, know who they are and, and utilize them. As the mother of about to be a nine-year-old who has severe hemophilia, you can speak to having, he's had what, one bleed? Mm -hmm. One bleed. So what kind of yeah. challenges do you find that Vincent faces? And I'm going to talk a lot about you as you're sitting right here. I hope you don't find me rude for doing so. What kind of challenges do you find that you guys face that is maybe different than what we faced growing up or the generation before us? You're someone who can speak, I think, really well to what, what the big challenges were and what they are now. Right. So my cousin has hemophilia, but he is a bit older than me, so I really don't remember when he was growing up, all the challenges that he had. And like I said, Vincent's only had one bleed. It was from an immunization. But it's still always on my mind, like, is it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Sometimes we forget that we have hemophilia because we're just so in our routine and everything has been going so great. But then sometimes we're pushed right back into it saying, whoa, slow down. You need to make sure that we're you know, on track and doing what we're supposed to be doing to keep us on this path of no bleeds. Vincent is very active. He plays in a, a bunch of sports, right? Right. He does basketball, baseball. He's swimming all the time. He rides his bike. He loves to play street hockey. So he is very, very active. Challenges and hardships are not unique 
to people with bleeding disorders. So someone like Jeremy lends a completely different perspective. So I started off in the football family. We, we were a football family who ran track as a rehab or as a punishment. So it was, it was never fun. We, it was just the same shape. So senior year comes around, it's the huge year where you want to just blow out and blow everyone out the wa water. And first game comes around and I break my arm and figured, you know, I'll stay in shape by running fall track and, you know, get my speed up. And I end up breaking state records and running at national levels. And this is way easier than pounding my body in football. And why not take this step? I got more scholarships to almost every school in the nation. I picked the University of Arkansas, the number one track school at the time. I won freshman year, uh, national champion and freshman All-American, and here I am running national and international levels, representing myself and countries all over the world. What else did you learn when you were in college about your body? I've suffered through a lot of migraines. I thought it was normal. Going to Arkansas, it's, it progressed a lot. I got to the point where I was very dizzy and very weak at times, and it turns out that I end up having hydrocephalus which is a buildup of spinal fluids in the brain, which causes pressure onto the brain, causing arachnoid cysts. And so I had to go through chemotherapy, a lot of radiation, a lot of spinal taps in order to treat what I thought it was just a simple migraine. Went through a lot of chemotherapy, and right before 2012 Olympic trials, I was ready to go and hopped on a track and tried to compete my heart out to represent the United States. Doctors are amazed at the fact that I'm still able to move because due to the, the location of the cyst on my brain, I'm supposed to lose all coordination, I'm supposed to be paralyzed by now, and here I am still running track and traveling around the world. <laughs> I always try to cover it up. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm still a normal person, you know. I, and real, I realize, you know, it's, there's a lot of people out there just like myself who, who suffer through the same thing. And, and the fact that I'm able to do this gives them a lot of hope, a lot of inspiration to continue doing what they want to do. Speaking of wanting to, to hide it, I think that's something that every family in this room can relate to on, on one level or another. Lauren, what have you found in terms of, of, of Vincent and just navigating life, navigating school, extracurricular activities? Are there areas where you say, we're not, we're not going to really talk about it here, or is it, are you guys just an open book? We're pretty much an open book. I mean, when he was first born, it was pretty hard on me. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. And then once I started getting more involved in the community and meeting other people, other moms was huge for me. It helped me accept it more. It helped me teach him how to accept it and that this is our life. I've never not told anybody. It's not like I'm like, oh, I'm Lauren. This is Vincent. He has hemophilia. But, you know, it comes, it comes up. All his coaches know about it. And it's not like some huge thing. It's just like, hey, he has hemophilia. It's a bleeding disorder. Here's my phone number. Here's his dad's phone number. I think the biggest thing for us is teaching him. You know, he's almost nine. He'll be out on the playground and kids will want to play, you know, touch football or whatever it's called, tag, I don't know, flag football, whatever. And something he, that doesn't involve tackling. Something that doesn't involve <laughs> tackling, but he'll be out there and he'll be like, okay, don't push me, I have hemophilia. And they're like, what? Like, <laughs> you know, they don't know what it is, but he's sticking up for himself. And that's like, that's my main goal is for him to stick up for himself and to start advocating for himself because I'm not there 24-7. The younger someone is as they start to develop their own sense of self-care and independence with their health, the better the habits are for their life going forward. If you ask me, there's no such thing as normal. Everybody's got something that's a little different about them. You know, everybody's got something they got to deal with that's different than anybody else. I've got a number of people that I talk to on a regular basis who, who just would rather pretend they don't have hemophilia. You need to be aware so that when, if you go into a hospital, you can fight for your rights and stand up for yourself and say, this is what I need, and I'm not leaving until I get what I need in some cases. I mean, I've had that experience going into emergency rooms where, where I say, hey, I need some factor. Oh, no, you don't, you don't need factor. I said, no, yes, I do. I've got a note here. Here's from my hematologist that says I have a bleeding disorder, and this is exactly how many units I'm supposed to get. Well, we need to test our, your blood ourselves to make sure. And so they go and they run a blood test. Oh, sure enough, your factor levels are low. I said, oh, thanks. Thanks for confirming that. What, what's something everyone in this room should know 
in the event that they wind up in the emergency room with a significant bleed. So I'll, I'll tell a story that, uh, that I've shared with you previously about my brother. He tore his rotator cuff a few years ago lifting weights. He was lifting weights and went back too far and tore his rotator cuff. And he had to go in and have surgery to get it fixed. And he went into the hospital um, and he said, I have hemophilia, I need to treat before the surgery to make sure I don't bleed too much. Um, but all that that particular hospital had on hand was a plasma derived product. And my brother has always used recombinant products. Now both of them work effectively well, the difference is with a, with a plasma derived product, you need a bigger dose for it to be as effective. My brother didn't know that. So he treated with the same size dose that he would have with a, plasma, with a recombinant product. And he was in college at the time and he went after the surgery and stayed at my mom's house for the recovery so she could help him out. And he woke up in the middle of the night, the day of the surgery, and he says, mom, I think I'm still bleeding. And his bandage in his shoulder was just soaked in blood. Uh, and so, so they rushed him back to the hospital and, got, and they figured out what the problem was and got him more factor. But that was an instance where he, he didn't realize that he needed a bigger dose because it was a different kind of product. He's a doctor now. He just finished med school last year. So hopefully he's figured that stuff out <laughs> and now. And he's an ER doc, right? Yes. So there's one ER we know he can go yeah, to. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, he's in Florida right now doing his residency. You just gotta so. get to Florida and yeah. you'll be fine. <laughs> you shared with me over the phone the discussion about moving from the port to infusing with the needle. Um, and how at this age, at nine, you, I forget the exact turn of phrase you had used, but it was reflective of it, it's time. Like he can start making these decisions for himself. And, you know, he's not even nine yet, but that's going to enable him as he gets older and older to be more comfortable and more comfortable in the event that he needs to be. And at some point, all of us need to be our own best advocate. Of course, we would both love to keep the port in forever just because we're used to it. We're comfortable. We know it works. We're... But that's not reality. And so, you know, it's been a struggle for both of us to kind of um, accept that the port is coming out and that we are going to be starting to learn how to self-infuse. And um, yeah, it's a lot of pressure on both of us, but it, that's life. I don't often talk to professional athletes. Surprise, I know. But I don't get those many, many opportunities. Can you tell us, if you're a professional track athlete, what, what is your day-to-day -day like? What does that even look like? Treatment before, three hour practice. And when you say treatment, it doesn't mean infusion. It's, it's, so what I'm saying treatment, it's those hard massage and huge buff muscular dudes just pounding away at your muscles. You run, run some more and run again for three hours and then you hit the weight rooms for about two hours. And then you get more treatment afterwards and where they just release all that tension. It doesn't stop at the track or at the weight room. We're, we go home and we're, we're focusing on our nutrition, focusing on our sleep. Everything we do revolves around making sure our body is equipped to run well and to perform well as an athlete. Do you have something that is a part of your day-to-day -day life, a consideration, a disorder, that your, your cohorts don't? How has your support system, your coaches, the trainers, the other athletes that you train with, how has that impacted the way in which you're able to adapt for your needs? So before I thought it would ostracize me, you know, I'd, I would say something and I'll tell them my whole condition and they'll just put me to the side and you do this workout and because you're this, this, and this, but voicing about my condition really opened, opened up the conversation for the whole group and they become more supportive and, and making sure that I'm doing the, the correct things, which makes it more easier for me to get through my day so you don't have to do it alone. You know, we're getting at that age where kids are liking to bully other kids and so that's, that's been our biggest struggle. I'm, you know, like I said, we've been blessed with no bleeds and our treatment is just been great for us. It's more on the emotional side of how do we get his friends involved without making him feel like an outcast. And luckily the walk is on his birthday this year. So I'm hoping that we can get a big group of his classmates to come so that way they can kind of see what it's, you know, what it's all about and start hearing that word more, hemophilia. Some people are afraid that they'll be dis discriminated against in their workplace or in their social circles because of it. To me, it's, it's just part of my, it's part of the conversation that I need to have with my friends so they understand if there's something that happens that they're prepared. But I, I, do, I do see that with a lot of people where they don't want to tell people. They don't want people to know. I, I've had some people specifically keep it a secret. Um, I know someone who works for a, for a school system as a teacher and she doesn't want her coworkers to know. I understand it. You don't want to be judged or, or treated differently because of that. But at the same time, you need people to be prepared to, to react if they need to. What are other things that we can do as a community, and, and I throw this up to anybody, to, to invite more people to be a part of it so that it's not so hard to talk about? I make jokes about it. 
I mean, I think that's always a good way to break the tension a little bit. I uh, hate humor. <laughs> I, I don't think tell. it's useful for anything. I noticed. Jeremy, I'm curious to know, you, in addition to the accomplishments you've already listed, you spent some time in law school, you're getting your MBA, you have a lot of dimensions to you. How specifically has your condition influenced the way you approach life, if it has? Or have you always just been Jeremy Dodson? I've always just been Jeremy Dodson. It's not Jeremy Dodson with a brain condition, Jeremy Dodson who gets migraines. I've just been Jeremy Dodson. But then when I have that conversation and when people find out about the condition I have, they, they end up just making Jeremy Dodson the superhero instead. Like, really, I'm just trying to live my life just like everyone else. I'm trying to get as many degrees as I can so I can make enough money to pay the bills, basically. Hemophilia affects a whole family. Um, it may just impact one individual in the family, but that impact is felt by the entire family. His dad got married and they have two little boys. And then, um, you know, so that's been a, a big change for Vincent is to having new siblings. They had moved into a house. I had gotten married and he had some siblings from my ex-husband, well now ex-husband. So we went through a divorce. So we've had a lot of life changes. I don't want to put that pressure on his dad also, like, oh, hey, you have a new baby, let's learn how to self-infuse as well. Right. So, you know, everything is kind of settled down, and it's like, um, this is the time where we can all devote, his stepmom, his dad, me, we can all devote a good solid six months into just focusing on learning how to self-infuse. Yeah. To be honest, I, I've, I've not made it an issue. I mean, because it's what I do for a living, every time I tell people, oh, I worked for a pharmacy and I work in this very niche industry. Well, how did you get into that? It's always, well, how did you get into that? That's very unusual. And so it comes up anyway, when you, just when I'm explaining what I do for a living. It's hard for me to, to hold off on that conversation with people. And I so understand. It, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're just, you're I the understand same way, very sure. well. Yeah. I was dating last year and I was, I was starting to play a game. It was how long can I go yeah. without it coming up? But it's not just a disorder, it's the community, it's where I devote my professional energy, it's all of my friends. And I was like, I'm kind of sick of that coming up on every single first date, usually before an appetizer arrives. But then one of our camera guys shared with me, he's like, well, if it makes you feel any better, it comes up on all of mine too. Because he's with us for all this stuff. I was like, all right, well then good, it's just part of our job then. I was very involved in the, the children's hospital in Colorado and I just saw them as another person. And, and I'm very involved with um, Lacey Henderson, who is a Paralympic athlete. And more attention goes to her because obviously, obviously she's missing a leg, but she tends to avert it back onto me. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's not as bad as this or it's not as bad as that. I'm still just a normal person. But that, I'm still just a normal person, is the whole point, right? So that people who can relate to what you're experiencing because they have a similar disorder, to see you thrive and hear you own it, however sort of modestly or under the radar, but just making sure that that's explicit on some level does tremendous good, again, especially as attention is going to rise on you. So continue to be open about it, albeit under the radar. You told me a story on the phone where I just had to stop you to kind of like digest it and go on a rant for a minute. Would you, maybe perhaps the first story of advocacy as it relates to Vincent, would you mind sharing with that with us? When I found out I was pregnant and that whole story? That's okay. Whole story. Okay. <laughs> like I said, my cousin has hemophilia, so my aunt's a carrier. My cousin has hemophilia. My mom is a carrier. I got tested when I was about seven, and they said that, you know, 99.9%, .9%, you're not a carrier. We recommend you get tested when you're older, but you're not a carrier. So then fast forward to when I was pregnant, and my mom was like, I don't know. I just have this weird feeling. Like, I feel like you need to get tested again. So I believe I was about... Uh, 18, 19 weeks pregnant, contacted Kaiser, the genetics department, wanted to get tested, and they're like, well, um, are you going to terminate if the baby has hemophilia? And I said, no. And they said, okay, well, then we're not going to move forward with the testing. We can just test him at birth. And, you know, being 21 when you're pregnant, hearing that is like, I'm sorry, what? And she's like, well, you have a couple more weeks to make that decision if you'd like to terminate the pregnancy or not. And I was just like, well, I'm, regardless, I'm not terminating, so, but I would still like, you know, I'd like to be prepared. This could potentially be my life. So um, we did a, little, a, a back and forth with Kaiser and um, finally 
persuaded them to do the testing. And you know, I think, um, you know, looking back now, and I've never really thought about this, but I feel like that was my first experience with having to be my own advocate. Two weeks before he was born, found out that I was a carrier. I'm like, see, he was, I had a pretty, you know, rough delivery, but I couldn't have a forcep, I couldn't have a vacuum, couldn't have a scalp monitor, and it's like, I was at the verge of a C-section, and these nurses could have been using a vacuum. And then we found out he did have hemophilia. They wanted him to have a, a couple bleeds and see what his bleeding pattern was like before we figured out what treatment plan we would do for him. Why would I want my child to go through a couple bleeds when I know he's severe, so I know he, at some point he's going to have a spontaneous bleed? Whose advice was this? Uh, am I allowed to say this? <laughs> this was at this. We were originally at Kaiser Oakland, and I mean, I loved everybody there. You know, my mom had been seen by doctors there. My cousin. It wasn't a personal, a personal thing. It's just this is not going to work for for me and him. I said, you know, I I want the port like now, and they're like, no, we want him to have a f couple bleeds. He needs to be over a year old, and then of course he had his immunizations at what, eight, nine months, and he got a muscle bleed, and so, um, you know, we rushed him to the ER, we had our medicine with us, because that was, we always had it with us, and um, it was 14 pokes to get an IV on him, and, uh, you know, I'll never forget, he's like red, sweaty, screaming, Stephen and I are going back and forth holding him, I'm like a wreck and they went for a vein in his head and I like, it was almost out of body. Like I can't even describe like the anger that I felt just like, what are you guys doing to my baby? So they finally got the IV going and a couple doses. And so after that, I was like, that is never in my life happening again, ever we transferred to Santa Clara Hematology and we were with an amazing doctor who respected what I wanted for him and what we wanted for our family and six weeks later he got a port placed. I have Kaiser. I don't like Kaiser. I don't think Kaiser is appropriate for our community. I think they service an at-large population really well, but they don't serve specialty populations well at all. That story tells me two things. Number one, you want to find out about a child's diagnosis in vitro. If you have that option and your medical team forbids it, they're not giving you the opportunity to be proactive about your own child's care. On top of that, if you don't want to have to go through bleeding episodes in order to come up with a plan, they want you to be reactive. That's an mm -hmm. active effort to make you reactive to your child's care. That is not the best way to treat anyone. Never let a medical professional tell you otherwise. You have the right to be proactive about your and your child's health. Whether it's Kaiser or anyone else, that is your decision, not theirs. End of rant. Jeremy. So Jeremy, for you, uh, you're 27. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, on your team of 40 who are training on this six day a week full time schedule, the eldest athlete is 36? 36. So using that, if we jump forward 10 years and you're 37, theoretically not running anymore, you're a superhero, so maybe it'll be different for you. What is your life after being a professional athlete? Have you given that thought? You have 700 degrees coming, so you have, you, you've got your options. What do you want to do in your life? So I want to help people, whether it's in track and field or outside of track and field, I just want to help younger individuals, inspire them, however that may be, and use the title of being an Olympian to help propel that in some matter, and to use all the education that I have, you know, while I'm still young, hopefully a law degree and an MBA, and to use all of that to better a community outside. If we go back 30 years, our community was in much different shape. If we go forward 30 years, there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of promise, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of interesting things that we're on the brink of. Mm -hmm. But what do you think we need to do in our generation to make sure that we have the best possible 30 years from now with starting that work today? Uh, I'm big on education of the history of the community. Um, I work a lot with the teens in this, in this area. Uh, I, work, I do the summer camps. I do a teen retreat. I do a lot of educational stuff with the teens. And 30 years ago, 40 years ago, your life expectancy if you were born with hemophilia was your teens. To understand how far we've come helps you appreciate where we are now, and it helps you understand that there are more steps to be taken in the future. I don't ever want to get complacent with where we're at as far as treatment. 
uh, the treatment we have now is spectacular and it's allowing people to lead basically normal lives. And to realize that if we want this community to keep moving forward, we need to be dedicated. And we need to continue to put ourselves into this community and be advocates for this community uh, from a legislative standpoint, going to Capitol Hill, going to Sacramento here in California, and, and speaking out on our behalf and letting people know we're here and we're important and we want to be taken care of. We need to be cognizant of what our options are and what our potential threats are. And we do that by educating of the work we've done in the past. Thank you to our three panelists for being up here today. For videos from other Powering Through events, visit poweringthrough.org. If you'd like more information on NCHS, visit their website at nc-hs.com. Or for more information on Believe Digi, visit believedigi.com.